Hello friends, I'm Lindsay Wellington from Dillon, Colorado here with a brief discourse on Paul Manship's Diana, a bronze sculpture originally cast in 1925. It is pictured here in our book, Sculpture by Penelope Curtis, uh, on page 228. Manship belonged to a group of sculptures in a movement loosely termed the New Classicism of the early 20th century. Instead of a revisitation of high Hellenistic or Romantic Augustan ideals, however, the new classical American artists, like Manship, pursued a rhythm of harmony and refined, repetitive lines of beauty, similar to the syncopated forms found in the Etruscan art of antiquity and late archaic Greek vase paintings. Manship's Diana is a small sculpture, one part of a set of two pieces theatrically portraying the myth of Diana and Acteon. The Acteon sculpture is not pictured. Um, in the book. According to the Roman poet Ovid, who wrote about this story in his Metamorphoses, Acteon was a hunter who stumbled upon the goddess known as Artemis to the Greeks, Diana to the Romans, while she was bathing with her nymphs. For a mortal man to gaze upon a committed virgin deity such as she was an offense punishable by death. Acteon could have escaped unnoticed, but the sight of Diana's untouchable beauty was too much for him. He lingered, eyes locked on the heavenly vision before him just a little too long. Diana does not kill him. She humbles him by shooting an arrow into him, which transforms him from a man to a deer. The hunter now becomes the hunted and learns what it feels like to flee for his life. Acteon is eventually torn apart by a pack of wolves. This is at least one version of the myth. Here is a visual of Diana by Paul Manship again. Manship is the artist responsible for creating the famous Atlas sculpture at Rockefeller Center in New York City. Diana floats on the wind of her swift speed and strong legs, a speed confirmed by the posturing of her wolf companion, running alongside her in flight from the voyeur Acteon. You can see how fast a stride the artist means to articulate she has, what grace and unity with the energetics of nature she has as well, far beyond that of a mortal human being because of the pairing of the goddess with this wolf right here. And the wolf is pretty much parallel to the ground. His feet aren't, his legs aren't touching anything. So he, he's flying. He's going fast. Um, let's see. Okay. So Diana's hair, however, is not whipped up in a frenzy in the breezes as one running might ordinarily display. This stylized patterned element in the human form reflects not only a geometrization of other modern art at manship's time, but it also whole, is wholly identifiable as Etruscan or archaic Greek in influence, hence the new classical order again. Diana and the wolf both turn toward what is behind them. Um, the goddess is focused like one taking aim, but her arrow has already been loosed, suggesting to the viewer that they have happened upon her immediately following the arrow's shot flight, an inevitable puncture of her victim. It is a warning in many ways. Her beauty and the musical quality of the sculpture draw the viewer in, and in the years since Diana's completion, I'm sure many viewers' eyes have lingered a bit too long on her. The sculpture and many others of manships were created at a time not too long after the age of the great excavations, when many sites of the ancient world were being discovered and uncovered, and the interest in antiquity, akin to the discovery of Pompeii in the 18th century, had risen to another all-time high. Think of 1920s and Egyptian-style makeup, head, circlets, and jewelry designed after those found or e either found or painted on the walls of King Tut's tomb. Um, Anyway, the age of the Great Excavations was a time spanning the decades roughly between 1870 and the onset of World War I in 1914. The new classicists sought their communicative treatment of sculpture, their story through posturing and precision of line, by the sculptural rendering of an idealized human form above all else. You can see here many parallel planes of action and stasis, many repetitive angles in the figure of Diana, allowing that sense of music and spherical harmony for which manship was renowned to speak for itself. See Diana's right elbow and her left knee are synchronistically placed. Her right shin and the hind quarters and legs of this wolf right here are parallel as well. And then the degree of rotation in the necks of both goddess and creature mirror each other as well. Conceptually, now I feel this piece reveals much about the climate of 1920s in America and arguably the entire world. The Western world, at least. The First World War completely desecrated Europe's sense of self, its dignity, and high cultural practices. The continent was raised in an utter disarray. 
Its aristocratic nation-state system had crumbled beneath the grotesque dismemberment which modern warfare had inflicted upon all the men who fought for either side. Oops. Art theory, which had for a time concerned itself with expressing this emotional disarray and despair, both before and after World War I, think Edward Munch and Kate Kollwitz, those sorts of paintings and drawings, um, began to turn more towards a renewal of classical scientific values. Artists began to express their hopes of healing the minds of their compatriots through art and re-inspiring faith in the re-emerging political and commercial orders of the world. It was a short-lived reality, however, and a false sense of security in the end. The crash of 1929 in America, together with the preemptive tremors of an impending Second World War, would eventually shatter this new classicism and forever taint its legacy on account of the overblown association it still has with Nazism. In conclusion, it seems that Diana shooting Acteon is indicative and metaphorically resonant to Paul Manship's peripheral modernity. Modernity, not maternity. Sorry. Um, the the cross-cultural hubris of that time was people's peering into the bathing waters of an unreachable presence, of some protected, beautiful peace, and a trusted national autonomy. But the conflicts of the world, it seemed, had only just begun. And much like putting a Band-Aid over a wound that really requires stitches, the ties were going to rupture again, and this time they would be overrun with infection. The hunter, an American industrialist of the 1920s, was soon to become the hunted, in a poverty never before seen across the country. And Europe at this time was more or less asleep at the wheel of a rolling locomotive of fascism, attempting to prevent whatever it was that brought on the Great War in the first place. Just like a Greek tragic play teaches its audience, oftentimes... The very methods we employ to avoid some sort of known horror are precisely the things which bring it upon us. Nonetheless, Paul Manship is a gifted, brilliant artist. Diana, from Diana and Acteon in 1925, is an exquisite work of fine art. My eye certainly rests upon it. My heart rests upon the many mysteries of beauty and truth which the sculpture sings to its audience, figuratively and conceptually. I am wary, however, of letting them rest too long. Thank you so much.